Hello, this is section 2.4 from James Stewart's Calculus Early Transcendentals book. And 2.4 is another section or topic on limits of a function. And today we are talking about the precise definition of a limit. Uh, we have pretty much so far been using limit laws and also graphs to determine the limit of a function as x approaches a particular value of a. And so today we want to formalize that definition um, using algebraic expressions. So let's just look at the definition of the limit here, the precise definition. It says, let f be a function defined on some open interval that contains the number a, except possibly at a itself. In other words, um, the function might not have an output at a, and that's okay because the limit could possibly exist. Okay, the function might not be continuous at a because uh, a is uh, appears elsewhere, but the limit could still exist and be a different number. Then we can say that the limit of f of x as x approaches a is l, and we write that limit expression here. If for every number epsilon bigger than zero, we can find another number delta bigger than zero such that if the uh, distance between x and a is bigger than zero and less than delta, then that would imply that the difference between f of x and l, its limit, is within epsilon. Okay, so let's explore what that means, because it might look a little odd. <laughs> but remember that the absolute value means, and uh, the absolute value of a distance means the the distance of a difference is the distance between those two numbers. So since x minus a, absolute value of x minus a is the distance from x to a, and the absolute value of f of x and minus l is the distance from f of x to l, and since epsilon can be arbitrarily small, then the definition of a limit can be expressed in words. Uh, it really means that the distance between f of x and l can be made really, really small by requiring that the distance between x and a be really, really small, but not necessarily zero, okay? We can also look at it in terms of intervals. So we note that absolute value of x minus a is really equivalent, you know, if you were to expand this out we from our absolute value definitions, you would have minus uh, delta less than x minus a less than delta. And then you can see if we add a to all three sides, we would have a minus delta less than x less than uh, a plus delta if we just added a to all three sides of that compound inequality. Okay, um, and I look, look to this over here, we kind of, in a sense, want to centralize a. So if we put a in the middle of an interval and we go up a distance of uh, delta and back a distance of delta, then we have a as the center of that interval and we can just pick any value x in that horizontal interval and say that the distance between x and a is within delta, okay? Similarly, we can do the same thing with absolute value of f of x minus l less than epsilon, and that's uh, equivalent to, uh, and the very same derivation of l minus epsilon is uh, less than f of x less than l plus epsilon. And we can write that and look at that in a vertical sense since our l would be a function output, so just consider this being the y-axis. So if we were to take our limit and go up a distance of epsilon, we get to L plus epsilon. And if we went down a distance of epsilon, we would get L minus epsilon. And if we had our F of X output somewhere in that range, we can say that the distance between F of X minus L is less than epsilon, okay? So, just to reiterate that definition, the limit as x approaches a of f of x is equal to this limit l means that for any epsilon, so any arbitrary epsilon value, and just think of that as like 0.01 or 0.1 or 1, for example, means that for any 1, no matter how small epsilon is or even how large, 
we can always find a delta, and that delta will always be dependent upon the chosen value of epsilon, um, such that if x lies in the open interval around a, then um, f of x is going to um, lie within the interval of l minus epsilon and l plus epsilon. So just taking a look at um, this definition, we usually always start with l. We were or we are starting with the expression f of x minus l less than epsilon. And so we would go up the l plus epsilon, we would go down the l minus epsilon, and then we would be going out to the graph and we uh, from these outer banks, so to speak, and then we would be going down, okay? And notice here that by me going down in that sense, um, I'm not seeing that A is central, good? So in general, what the idea is, is that we're on a mission to find the value of delta that will guarantee that any X in there is gonna be within my beltway of F of X minus L within epsilon. So the next step would be in calculating delta or finding that delta is, is to calculate this value, delta one, and calculate this value, delta two, and we can quickly find those if we knew what this value is and what this value is, right? And this would be our x1 and our x2, good? And then we would choose our real delta to be the minimum of delta one and delta two, because if we chose the minimum, we can just cut it off here, and you can see that delta one here. We would still have that any x coming up is always going to be within our range of L plus epsilon. If we chose the bigger one, we might go outside. And if we went outside, we would be outside of the belt and it wouldn't be the case, right? So we always wanna choose the smaller of the deltas and actually center our A. All right. So it also is important to realize and, and um, that the process uh, that we illustrate must work for every positive number epsilon, no matter how small it's chosen. So if we choose epsilon to be smaller, then it's very likely that delta will also have to be smaller. Okay, and it, it coincides with how we've been determining limits graphically. We want to ensure that the limit of the function outputs from the left equal the limit of the function outputs from the right for our two-sided limit to exist. And this is how we formalize it by uh, starting with our limit and going um, up and down from our function outputs and then back down to the x-axis. So let's practice with this example here. Let's find our chosen value of delta. So I see that um, here we are looking at an expression of the limit as x approaches x naught of f of x equal to l. And in this case, we have the limit as x approaches two of x squared plus two is going to equal six. And we're given a value of epsilon equal to one. So notice here, I've got, this is my L. L is equal to six. And if I go up epsilon, I would be L plus epsilon is gonna equal seven. And L minus epsilon is gonna equal five, right? And we are going out to our graph and we are going down. So this point here, cause we have our coordinates is 2.24. And this point here, is going to be 1.73. Our x naught, or our a in this case, is equal to two, and we want to centralize it, right? So we are calculating the distance between two and 2.24, and we see here that delta one is equal to 0.24, and that is 2.24 minus two. We see that delta two is gonna equal 
2 minus 1.73, and that's going to give us 0.27. So we want to choose delta to be the minimum of delta 1 and delta 2. Oh. And that's going to be um, the minimum of 0.24 and 0.27, and that's going to be 0.24. Okay. So down here we have answer choices. If x is within 0.25 of 2, then f of x is within 1 of 6. Is it 0.25? It's not 0.25, but we do want to model if x is within delta of a, or x naught, then f of x is within epsilon of L. So now we have all of those values and we can plug them in and we can say if x is within 0.24 of x naught, which is 2, then f of x is within epsilon and our epsilon is 1 and our limit is 6. So, and everything else would be the same. And I see that um, we have that this is equal to C, right? If X is within 0.24 of two, then F of X is within one of six. All right, so that's how you can use the formal definition of um, the limit as X approaches a number using a graph. You want to minimize your deltas in the range and you want to start with the, the distance between the limit and f of x. So here's how you would use an epsilon delta proof on a linear function and that's all I'm requiring for calculus 3a. In real analysis and higher courses you'd have to use uh, more nonlinear functions and uh, more complex algebraic manipulations to find your delta. But here, again, we would start, so we want to show that for every epsilon bigger than zero, there exists a delta bigger than zero, where if zero less than, if the distance between x and a is less than delta, then the distance between f of x and l is less than epsilon. So we tend to start with f of x minus l less than epsilon. So I'm going to take my function f of 5x minus 1, because that is my f of x, and my 6 is my a, and 29 is my l. Right, because we have the limit as x approaches a of f of x equal to l. So we have those values and we go ahead and plug them in. So here we have 5x minus 1, and then we have minus, and our l is 29. And our epsilon is still just an arbitrary epsilon. My goal is to get to. Oh, my goal is to get to absolute value of x minus a so that I can find my delta, right? So in this case, we want x minus 6. And that's how we can choose our delta. So I'm going to start manipulating, and I do want to make note that it is true that absolute value of a constant times x is going to equal the absolute value of that constant times the absolute value of, of x. So you can factor a constant out of that absolute value. So um, just make sure you factor out the constant or the absolute value of that constant. So I'm going to start manipulating here and I'm going to collect my like terms and minus 1 minus 29 is minus 30. I'm going to factor out a 5 And now I'm going to use that property. I'm going to factor out that 5 from the absolute value expression. 
And now since that is positive, I can divide by that on both sides of the inequality without changing the inequality. And absolute value of 5 is 5. So now I have my goal of x minus 6. And so I can say for uh, epsilon um, bigger than 0, choose delta to be epsilon over 5. So epsilon does depend, or delta does depend on the value of epsilon. And since epsilon was arbitrary, I did not specifically define or quantify epsilon. Um, the limit or the statement is true for all, right? For all epsilon, right? And what is that statement? I've found a delta and that delta, so if, if epsilon was one, choose delta to be one divided by five. If epsilon is 0.01, choose delta to be 0.01 divided by 5. And so you can see that it will work for any epsilon. And then the statement will be true. Okay, that's it. Uh, next up is a discussion on continuity of f at a point A. Take care.